I'm going to talk about something totally different. It's actually new for me. And the reason I wanted to talk to you guys about it is because you're going to be the people who are going to have to deal with this stuff the rest of your lives because it's all about um, climate adaptation and mitigation and kind of thinking about how are we going to make things better because I'm going to be dead and you guys will be like, okay, we got kids now, how, you know, how are we going to deal with all this stuff? And you're going to vote and you're going to do whatever you're going to do. But this is, this is kind of how we're trying to address this stuff now. So there's these two questions associated with this is one is how vulnerable are our managed resources to climate change? So we as an agency have a mandate to manage resources. For the most part, our actual real mandate is things that aren't alive. It's the rocks, the minerals, all that kind of stuff. But you can't exclude the things that live on the rocks and live in the ocean. Atmosphere. So kind of by default, we, we're engaged with a lot of those things. So what, which one of those things is going to be particularly vulnerable to climate change? And then what can we do to limit or reduce that vulnerability? So is there anything we can do to change how susceptible they are? Okay, so next slide, please. So this is this, there's basically a lot of ways to look at this, but it's what's called climate smart adaptation. And this is just being smart about how you do things, how you manage things, what your choices you make as an agency, okay? You can also think about this in your own life too. It's like you can kind of change the names and apply it to, all right, do I use plastic liners in my trash can or I just use a trash can and every once in a while I have to wash it out when it gets, you know, so I'm not putting a lot of plastic into the landfill, etc. Anyways, phase one is to identify your conservation targets. We literally did that yesterday, okay? So the cool thing is <clears throat> we have our sister sanctuaries and the Greater Fairlawns is one. They're right next to us and the Olympic Coast is up in Washington. Both of those sites, and I thank goodness that this has happened, have done climate, you know, CV, what we call CVA's climate vulnerability assessments, just completing them, okay, or just about to complete them. So we're all in the large, you know, same California current large marine ecosystem. So a lot of the things they've done, we don't have to repeat. We can, we can kind of co-opt them and just tweak them a little bit. So the cool thing is we've we've added a few things that the others didn't include and we dropped things that don't occur here. But basically we've identified species, habitats, and in both ecosystems or ecosystem services that we think might be particularly vulnerable to climate change. And so the next part is to go, all right, you think they might be affected by climate now let's figure out how they will be affected by climate or how we think they will be affected by climate, okay? Because then the next part is, okay, we've identified what's driving some of these susceptibilities. Is there anything we can do about it? What are our different choices? Then ultimately you go into, let's actually implement and do some of these things and see if it actually happens. And then you can kind of, you know, go through the whole um, process again. Okay, next please. So, um, Define focal resources. So we just did that. We, we're, we're at about, um, we have, uh, what was it? 45 species, nine habitats, and nine ecosystems. That's our draft list. So it's, it's in the middle between what Greater Fairlawns did and what um, Olympic Coast did. So species, this is biogenic habitat or um, regular old habitat. Then we're going to do the assess the resource of vulnerability. So that's why that's what's going to be like eating at my soul for the next six months, <laughs> because um, I don't find this particularly fun. But work's not necessarily always fun. So when I get to go out and do cool black abalone stuff or go do diving, this is my other. This that's the yin and this is the yang. So you <laughs> yeah. got to have a little bit of both in in a job. Okay. So next, please. So. We want to assess the vulnerability of our resources, our focal resources, which are again species, habitats, and ecosystems to climate change impacts. And so what we want to do is think about the sensitivity, exposure, and adaptive capacity of those things. Okay, so next please. <clears throat> so here's vulnerability. It is a function of how sensitive you are to climate change. And climate change could be Increased sea surface temperature, 
changes in salinity, changes in pH, changes in wave action. I mean, there's a whole host of things that we think are climate-driven um, uh, mechanisms of change. It's exposure to it, so it's not just that you have to be sensitive to it. Like, I might be sensitive to swords, <laughs> right? They could chop me in half, but I just don't get exposed to swords very often, so <laughs> who cares, right? So it's the exposure to those changes, and then is there a capacity to adapt to those changes, okay? So is there something that can be done that allows it to not feel the effects, okay? So we have exposure and sensitivity, its impact, and then its potential adaptive capacity. All of these feed into whether something's vulnerable or not. Okay, next please. Boom. This is, in brief, what something like that would look like. So this is for a blue rockfish, okay? You generate like a real brief summary that just kind of said, hey, blue rockfish are cool. <laughs> you know, people eat them. They have these kinds of functions in the system. These are the kind of habitats they live in. And then you go, okay, what are they sensitive to? And then you go, okay, are they sensitive to dissolved oxygen? Yes or no, one through five. In this, in this system, you get a score. And then how confident are you? pH, salinity, um, the Pacific decadal oscillation, sea surface temperature. So there's a whole bunch of things. So basically you get like a worksheet and you have experts who go, I know blue rockfish. I know a bit about the systems they live in here in central California. And I know a bit about climate change based on that information. And it's not on here, but there's references. People have published papers. This is my opinion. And then somebody else says, well, yeah, I've read those papers too. Here's my opinion. So you have multiple people giving their opinions on something. We look at those scores, average them out. And then you also have your confidence. Some things are wild ass guesses because we have no information is a gut feeling. Other things like, oh no, there have been six papers looking at the effects of pH on survivorship of juvenile blue rockfish. We know what happens with it, both in mesocosms, in laboratory experiments, and out in the field. So it's a range of things. So you can be really have a high confidence or you may have low confidence or be somewhere in between. That's the state of the art. It's not like we have a vulnerability gun. We go out there and go, <laughs> boop. All right, it's really a, you know vulnerable to salinity and pH. And you know, so it's it's kind of when I learned about this, I go, oh, this doesn't seem very scientific, but it's the best we've got. And so the idea is you think about all of the different climate change variables that might impact a resource. How vulnerable are they? How sensitive to it are they? And what's the exposure to it? So same thing like us, like we have people who might be super sensitive to COVID, like if they get it, they're dead. But if they live on a mountain in a hut and nobody ever sees them, chances are they're never gonna get exposed, okay? <clears throat> so a lot of, so I just wanna show you, this is like what, you know, a, an assessment actually kind of looks like. Okay, next one. <clears throat> and this is kind of what we kind of go through in terms of, we talked about the climate, there's disturbance, and then there's also a whole list of things that are not climate driven. So pollution, overfishing, you know, other uses. We would say like climate doesn't, you know, really affect it, or at least not in a, in a real way. And <clears throat> climate may exacerbate some of those things, but it may also do have nothing to do with it. So we think about those things too. Okay, next please. All right, so ultimately, if you have, oh, and then, sorry, the, 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 third, the, the third thing was, do you have the uh, ability to adapt? So do you have a really th broad thermal tolerance? Can you move to a different habitat? Can a beach move and retreat higher up? If you rode the cliffs, will you get more rocky intertidal or does it change to beach? So there's all these kind of ideas of adaptive capacity if you're highly adaptive and you have low sensitivity and exposure, you're not very vulnerable. Versus you have no chance of adapting and you are super sensitive and you get exposed a lot, you are gonna have problems, okay? Next, so here for um, habitats, this is an example of what came out from the Greater Fairlawns where they, these are actual scores and kind of in the space from 
low vulnerability over here to high and kind of where the different ones were. The funny thing is, see this one here, kelp forest? So when they did this the first time, this was in 2014. This is right at the onset of the marine heat waves. This is right at the onset of them starting to lose all their kelp force. So everybody in the room at that time was like, eh, kelp force are great. Now they're like, oh my God, we've had no kelp for like seven years. They're freaking out. So this just goes to show you, we may think we know what's going on, but obviously all it takes is some big event to really expose our ignorance. So this is gonna change. But anyways, that's just gonna give you an example. <clears throat> all right, next please. So when you're kind of thinking about some of the stressors for like what they, one of the things they focused on was some of the habitats. You're looking at buildings and roads right here where it's just gonna get eroded. It's just gonna get chewed away. And so wave action, coastal ero erosion, sea level rise. These are really important things. San Francisco airport is like that much above sea level. And it's really, it's, they're gonna be like, where are we gonna put a new airport? Or are they gonna start building a wall around the landing strip so that planes can still land? New Orleans it off. Think, think about that, right? Oh, let's build a seawall. We'll get another 50 years out of this airport. Think about that one day when something happens to the seawall. Holy smokes. Can you imagine all the planes that won't be able to land in San Francisco? That will be like the biggest news thing ever where the air, where the runway gets flooded. And it's not like you can just go, oh, we'll just, you know, get a pump. It's like San Francisco Bay is gonna flood into that thing. Anyways, real considerations. Okay, next please. <clears throat> Some of the non-climate stresses I was talking about is there's roads and coastal armoring and, and things like our, our near shore environment that um, sometimes are designed to help, sometimes end up hindering. Invasive species um, can be a problem and even just land use change. Yeah. Here in, in, well not here, this is Monterey, where I live up in, in Santa Cruz, there's a whole area um, where there's a road, it's called um, Westcliff Road, and it went right along the bluffs and, because, and they used to have armoring down there and it just kept getting rotary, rotary, rotary while well, they finally closed the road to a one lane and eventually they're gonna basically have to close the road because it's just getting eaten up. And there are houses, multi-million dollar houses because it's a house, a road, and the ocean. <laughs> so those houses are like, ah, I've got the multi-million dollar view. But it's like, guess what? Pretty soon you're gonna be on the beach and you won't be able to live in your house anymore. So these are all things where there's, and this is what this shot's kind of showing, hey, we've got these big walls and it's just kind of going over. Pacifica to the, just south of San Francisco, same sort of thing. You got in south of you guys in Palos Verdes, same sort of thing. They're like rebuilding the roads every year because it's In Malibu, just, like, like, like Malibu. Point Doom, Point Doom is happening too. So a lot of uh, stuff. And so you think, well, how does a beach have adaptive capacity? Well, you think about is there space for the beach to retreat so you still have beach habitat? Well, it doesn't if there's a road right there and if there's houses right behind the road. And that's where there's gonna be real, like not in my lifetime necessarily, or maybe when I'm close to dying, but in your guy's lifetime, it is gonna be a thing where they're like, hey, guess what? All you people living on that houses, we're gonna buy them from you at fair market value and you now have to move. Just like if we were building a highway in Iowa and a farm, Imminent domain, government's gonna just do it because that's gonna now be beach for the next 50 years. That's planned, but not desired retreat in the sense of we're planning to move you out. And so that's gonna be a real issue. So don't buy property right on the beach. Yeah. <laughs> All right, next please. And so anyways, so um, just quickly, they're, they're talking about beaches here, estuaries and rocking their tile. So next slide. So what you wanna do is can we reduce exposure? Can we change the sensitivity of these things? Um, can we make increase adaptive capacity? And if you have these things working in concert, maybe we can reduce the vulnerability. Next slide. Um, now this shows you 
just generically, you might have multiple scenarios for this. So for example, with sea level rise in an estuary, which we have right here at Elkhorn Slough, you guys, um, oh no, you didn't. We haven't got Sorry, up sorry, yeah. it's up north. I drove past it coming down here. Um, so Elkhorn Slough, for example, has subsided. There's not the normal natural influx of sediment to keep up with subsidence, okay? It was also dammed and diked for duck hunting and a bunch of other things that exacerbated that. So what they've done is they've said, we're gonna bring in materials, we're gonna actually raise level up to try and keep up with sea level rise because the plants, uh, like this um, salicornia, pickleweed, these things that live in estuaries, they're just dying because they have nowhere to go. Because all around the area is either steep slopes in like Oakland chaparral stuff, or it's being used by agriculture. So they were able to take an old dairy farm, they bought the land from the owner, and now they've made a huge new um, section, of 100, over 100 acres of new salt marsh that should um, allow um, the habitat to move into it over the next 50 to 100 years, which is really cool. So there's different scenarios of things that you can do. You have these adapt adaptation strategies. You try and implement them. You try and get the money to do them. You try and get the people to believe in them. You do experiments associated with them to see, hey, we thought if we planted everything in a uniform pattern, it would be better than clustering them together. And they're finding out that a lot of the things that they did um, they know how to improve them next time around when they do another section of the march in terms of restoration. And I think that's okay. So, don't hit, don't hit the next one. <gasps> it's exciting. So. Aww, I want it. <laughs> you'll get to. Oh, cute. Yes. So, one of the things that Sean said was that his students would like to see. Is pictures of Sean. Oh, <laughs> stories. I said stories. Uh, stories. Yeah, no, no. So, so, stories. so I'm gonna let the pictures. Uh, uh -oh. you, yeah, you can make your own stories. I might, I might add to. So, go ahead. Hit the hit this first one. So here's uh. a shot back when he was doing a postdoc <laughs> at Stanford, and um, so a lot of the uh, unfortunately, but. The only time I get to see Sean is usually at our WSN meetings, just because we're, we're different parts of the state. But um, one of the things I always do is I'm usually taking pictures. So I try to give you guys a little bit of, of a sense of Sean uh -uh. In, in, back in the day. So this is almost this is 18 years ago this month. And um, and we're going to see Gabriel in, uh, in about three hours when we stop to have dinner in San Francisco. Look at those little cheekies. <laughs> and now he's like this tall compared to me. So anyways, next one. Uh, I love this one. I'm no rocket surgeon. Uh, <laughs> and so um, one of the cool things that happens at, at the WSN meeting, since you guys are going to be going, is there's um, on the evening of the presidential banquet, there's usually an auction. There's selling of stuff. There's people. kind of. It's a great opportunity to mingle and just meet a lot of professors, meet other students from other CSUs and UCs. It's just a really cool thing. So... Um, next one. <laughs> one of the things that happens during the auction is people um, basically buy, you know, auction items urged on by their students or shamed into doing it. And so for a long time, we had um, a guy who um, was the auctioneer. And so back then, Sean was a buyer. Um, and usually there's grad students who dress up and do things and basically take the stuff around. So this one was called um, Rafe's, uh, I can't even read that, Crazatonia or something like that. So the, this was the auctioneer, Rafe Sagarin, who unfortunately passed away. But this was his Cactus Crunk, which is just a fancy label on, I think, like... Uh, Cactus Cooler or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So anyways, all right, so next, please. Then... <laughs> this guy became one of the auctioneers with his good buddy Mark Steele. Um, so then he would dress up in different elaborate costumes, and he was one of the people who was trying to shame other people into buying stuff because it all goes to support the students, which is so it's really for a good cause. So here's one of the outfits next, and then the outfits got um, more <laughs> elaborate. So this was unfortunately when Rafe had passed. So Rafe had this crazy black 
curly hair. So everyone was wearing wigs in his honor. Is that Ben on the that's left ben, of me? That's Ben. From oh my Pat God! Holly right there. And so um, this this was the only one I could show. Uh, to you guys. <laughs> uh, next. Uh, and then this is, I think this is the last one. This is a team just to show. He's been coming up. So that's at the whole enchilada in Moss Landing. I, 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 if yep. you guys are going up there, you, you'll drive by it. But so it's been really cool to get to meet, you know, various classes. Every generations. Years. Generations of students have come through and see the stuff. And I hope you guys appreciate the fact that this guy brings you out to do this stuff and to see really cool habitats to kind of get a little flavor of people who are working in these different places hopefully it's something that inspires you to continue on in your own academic endeavors in your own pursuits about learning and being stu good stewards of the environment and ideally you get exposed to like different kinds of jobs and what different people do so like I so was joking before, it's like, you know, oh, you know, I got a government job and I never thought I'd take a government job. But now 20 years later, because, you know, I was told my wife, I said, oh, I'll take this job until I get a real one. <laughs> and so that was 20 years ago. And what I recognize is that working for the government has had some real cool benefits, particularly in stability and kind of quality of life. Like, I know this guy works 10 times harder than I do. And he does so much for you guys, so much for the university, so much for the campus, the institution. And I recognize, like, I don't think I could have done that as an academic, as much as I wanted to at the time, because I really enjoy the teaching part. But being, you know, chair or being on a faculty committee, being on student committees, those are all other service. So I want you guys to appreciate that there's a lot of cool things in academia, but in the government, there's a lot of cool things in government. There's also crummy things. There's crummy things in any job you get because it is work. It is not play, it is work. But the more cool things you can do in a job, like what I get to do is go scuba diving, do intertidal work, um, get to work with a lot of really cool um, students um, from various academic institutions around here, it's great. But think about that. Don't limit yourself to like, hey, I only wanna pursue this kind of job. The last bit of advice I'll give is make sure that you try different things because it's as important to know what you love as it is to know what you don't love. Don't be like my brother who got a chemistry degree from Davis, worked in the lab for two months, was like, screw this, I'm going back to construction because that's what I did to put myself through school and he be he was a contractor the rest of his life. He didn't need to have that chemistry degree. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was pretty cool that he could tell people and they were like, oh, this guy knows what he's talking about. But it's like, he didn't need to do that because he never went into the lab for it as a job. He was always working outdoors as a construction worker. Mm -hmm. And when he was done, he's like, ah, screw this. I found out as an undergrad, when I went underwater and took a midterm underwater, which is true at UCLA, we actually took a midterm underwater. I was like, this is the coolest thing ever. I want to somehow do this the rest of my life. And I was fortunate enough to get a job here where I still get to go underwater and I get to teach people stuff and I get to learn stuff all the time. So anyways, keep trying different things. <laughs>